Greg Wood is a senior lecturer in criminology, criminal justice, and legal studies at San Jose State University, where he teaches criminology, criminal justice, and legal studies courses with the Department of Justice Studies. An internationally respected law enforcement and legal trend expert, constitutional scholar, and student of history, Greg Woods is regularly featured on television, radio, podcasts, and in print. In addition to his own presentations, Greg is involved in curriculum development for the Center for Continuing Education, CCE, with an emphasis in the areas of criminal justice, constitutional law, legal remedies in response to police misconduct, and other hot topic areas. He received his JD from San Francisco Law School. Greg Woods may be reached at greg.woods at sjsu.edu. If the truth sets us free, as the scripture indicates, what will the opposite bring? An absence of freedom? Bondage? Incarceration? We must learn to see fraud differently. Fraud, a material misrepresentation of fact, intended to induce reliance upon this material misrepresentation, the lie, amounting to a loss, a loss of, well, as we will examine today, a magnitude that perhaps is, well, inconceivable. Numerically, we might count the loss in, well, millions, billions dollars. Something more precious than dollars is at stake while we consider fraud, trust, belief, integrity. What do we believe in? If the truth sets us free, as the scripture indicates, what will the opposite bring? The atheists among us have already concluded such notions reflected throughout Scripture to be lies anyway. Case closed. The ecumenical tradition provides lessons of morality transcending time. The Western tradition, allegorical in nature, like Aesop's fables, the boy who cried wolf. From the wolf of Wall Street to the boy who cried wolf and back again, transcending time and space, the human condition subjecting us to that which we are most vulnerable, truth. And what follows is an examination of fraud and an analysis of legal trends and legislative solutions, you know, hopefully bringing attention to contemporary issues of fraud specific to swatting, <laughs> swatting lies, swatting flies, that which we attribute perhaps through Aesop's fables, the personification of the animal to speak yeah, as the human might under the similar condition. We might convince ourselves to accept the deep fakes, fraud, and the deep fakes that, well, life presents, particularly online, on the internet, where we have been conditioned at least over these past two decades uh, a trajectory that, well, some of us are more comfortable with. We might look to the population, those senior citizens, <laughs> uh, the individuals who have arrived at a state of technology, perhaps unnaturally, uh, not to be confused with the millennials, those individuals who are native to the technology and, well, might not necessarily be as acquainted with life's Hmm, perhaps at times cruel lessons. <laughs> hmm. Cryptocurrency in our time, from which we might very well recall monopoly. <laughs> the money, the currency that is used to play monopoly. Somehow we have to convince ourselves that the legitimacy of cryptocurrency can be commercially interchangeable with, well, those things that might very well be good for all debts, private and public as our currency so indicates. I'd like to bring your attention to fraud in all of its forms, from antiquity, from scripture, where we might look to before the common era, Mosaic law, 
<laughs> it's the ninth in those Ten Commandments, that which deals with bearing false witness. <laughs> something that a practitioner in the law might relate to, yet something committed to, well, scroll. <laughs> Thousands of years ago, the human condition and dependent of the technology of the time has always been riddled with fraud. Fraud in the factum, <laughs> calling upon the Latin, not necessarily specific to scripture, where we might look to the Latin interpretation of scripture, like the book of Daniel, <laughs> the deceit that might very well destroy the covenant, these notions that have been transferred to us through time, not the least of which, at least in the Judeo-Christian tradition, the gospel of John. <laughs> Where the truth shall set us free, again, I ask you to consider the opposite of what freedom looks like, the opposite of truth, the opposite of truth, lies, the opposite of truth, deceit, misrepresentation, fraud in all of its forms, permeating our 21st century sensibilities. <laughs> With the conditioning of, well, perhaps doing things remotely, maybe uh, because of the pandemic era that we have emerged from. <laughs> no shortage of fraud to point to there. Or the yearly uh, accumulation of the loss that we might be able to attribute to fraudulent means. Astronomical as we consider, continue to consider it. Maybe the gospel of John was on to something. Maybe the truth will set us free. It's also been said that the truth hurts. <laughs> mm. In what follows is to be an example of how fraud well, hurts us considerably more. More importantly, we look to the law and those legal practitioners to bring about justice. To do so, we must learn to see fraud differently to identify those factors at play that indicate a scheme before suffering the loss. But where can we begin to identify those fraudulent schemes? It was in the year 2023 where we look to, well, examples all around us. Examples from the least and, well, from those that we expect the most from. How about those elected officials <laughs> through their constitutional imperative, a duty to perform, to craft legislative solutions in response to those problems that impact us most severely? And I might now point to the representative from New York, the Democrat, Jamal Bowman. He pled guilty <laughs> to a misdemeanor, eh. pulling the fire alarm at the Capitol building. <laughs> Now, a product of the educational system, academia, I have uh, noticed from time to time, usually around finals administration week, where final exams are, well, administered. For some reason, the fire alarm seems to be pulled more often than not. <laughs> and we all, well, we file out of the building. And sometimes it compromises the integrity of the test-taking process. Sometimes the impact is immediately, well, understood to be in the fact of a rescheduling of the final exam. Perhaps that's the objective of pulling the fire alarm. There was a political motive for Jamal Bowman, the representative of New York, who pulled the fire alarm, who pled guilty to the misdemeanor who agreed that he would be paying the maximum fine in Washington, D.C., this congressman, an individual who has sworn an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution, and as they you know, perfect their duties, as they do in Capitol Hill at the Capitol building, the People's Building, it was Bowman who pulled the fire alarm and... We examine these antiquated notions like the morality tale, Aesop's fable, the boy who cried wolf, what the wolf represents, the personification of the salivating predator. 
And we recall that it was the boy who cried wolf. It was the boy who had a very specific responsibility, a duty on behalf of the community. He was sent away from the community to rest with, well, that which was valuable. We think about how we value our nation's capital, how we value how it is that our laws are crafted, how it is that those laws are enforced. And for those practitioners within the judicial system who practice within every jurisdiction throughout our nation, we have to believe in something. And where they make those laws that are enforced, that are applied, that are tested throughout the courts, we have Representative Bowman, who did what, well, many students have done, pleading guilty to it, a count of falsely pulling a fire alarm. Now he said, oops, my bad. (laughs) Even though he said, I am responsible for activating the fire alarm and I will be paying the fine. (laughs) I will continue to represent the good people of New York. Mm. We think about this institution And all of our hmm, institutions, significant in our form of government, the way that we hold ourselves out through the constitutional mandate, through the duties we have assumed. (laughs) It is the United States Congress where we look to hopefully have model behavior. Uh. Unfortunately, it's Congress and those individuals who serve the interests of the people who craft those laws in response to, well, those threats that impact us most, that impact our quality of life, that impact uh, every practitioner's ability to hold themselves up in court with an honest uh, assertion of a good faith belief that an individual is in fact responsible or not responsible, liable, not liable, Guilty, not guilty. What is the opposite of truth? If it'll set you free, well, what will the opposite of truth bring you? Bondage, incarceration, dependency, oppression? It's the United States Congress that we hope might be able to identify these problems. Yet it's those individuals in Congress, and not necessarily the Democrat, Republican. Well, since we mentioned Democrat, we might as well mention the Republican from New York. I'm talking about Mm -hmm. that most recent expelled gentleman from Congress, Representative George Santos, uh, expelled uh, because of his alleged fraud, campaign finance violations, He has the distinction of being the first congressman expelled from Congress since James Traficant in 2002. That's over two decades ago. Uh, Traficant represented the people of Youngstown, Ohio, the 17th district, where he was routinely uh, a voice in the wilderness. His federal corruption charges and campaign funds that he absconded with for personal use. That was enough to get him expelled from Congress. George Santos, well, (laughs) the butt of virtually every joke that we have had in our our own satire that is uh, any term that Congress may serve. Virtually everything that George Santos said about himself (laughs) has been proven to be a lie. Where do we put our faith If the truth shall set us free, what will the opposite bring us in the alternative, the opposite of truth, deceit, misrepresentation, (laughs) oppression, lies? If the truth will set us free, well, (laughs) what about Sam Bankman freed? (laughs) As we begin to understand the fraud that is perpetrated, we might assemble uh, faces, human faces, where we might look to the face of fraud. Sam Bankman freed the opposite of free. Sam Bankman fraud from St. Thomas Aquinas and the seven deadly sins of antiquity. 
we have greed. And we have Sam Bankman freed, rhymes with greed. <laughs> uh, the opposite of freed, for he has been found guilty. Guilty of fraud-based crimes, all perpetrated through his responsibilities in maintaining his exchange, the FTX cryptocurrency exchange, now out of business, because the Department of Justice says so. From Judeo-Christian scripture to cryptocurrency, from the boy who cried wolf to the wolf of Wall Street, if free cost nothing, being free, what's the cost of lies? We must see fraud differently. We must be able to separate the cost from the drama. We must solve the problem. We must understand the severity of the problem, material misrepresentations of fact intended to induce reliance, creating damages, Damages, as we will see, are financial, but so much more profound. I mean, after all, what is it that a person might very well do when they are considering the likelihood that they have lost everything? Hmm. Part of the notion of fraud itself is the impact upon the victim, the victim who, well, might very well feel responsible for putting their trust in the wrong direction, in the wrong hands. They place their item of wealth for which they have now lost. The problem, the severity of the problem is the cost riddled with the drama of the facts themselves. We must be able to identify fraud in all of its forms before it manifests. To solve the problem, we must reverse engineer fraud so that we might undo uh, the damage that it has yet to do, the damage that we have yet to discover, because we won't discover the loss until it's gone. We don't know we're victims until after the crime. We don't know that the bomb threat isn't real until after the alarm has been pulled. We must see fraud differently. Now, we consider Bowman and his slap on the wrist, the expulsion of trafficant, well, the most recent expulsion of Santos. But we have to understand that these are symptoms of culture, culture we've grown to accept in the highest locations of our own government, our own justice system, judges subject to bribe, influence wielding, corrupt senators. As we stay within the New York area, maybe cross over to New Jersey and remind ourselves that it was Senator Bob Menendez who, well, was discovered with gold bars in his mm, suits, in his closet. Where else would you keep your gold bars? These gold bars happen to be the product of a theft in receipt by way of the, at least the indictment suggests, those individuals who represent the interests of Egypt, the nation of Gutter, these nations in the Middle East that are hoping to wield influence by increasing the wealth of one Bob Menendez, who is the senior ranking official serving on the Foreign Policy Committee in Senate, the Senate of the United States, Congress, the House of Representatives, the Senate, riddled with allegations of fraud. Is this a cultural problem? Is this something that we must increase our awareness so that not only can we relieve ourselves of the likelihood of suffering from fraud, suffering the loss? We look to Congress. We look to the Senate for those legislative solutions to society's problems that impact us most. And Americans, at least according to the Federal Trade Commission last year, lost $8.8 .8 billion to fraud. And as we're considering the loss associated with fraud, and we might not necessarily include all that we might lose. During the pandemic era, at least uh, as the Department of Justice announced in conjunction with, well, 
the notification that they have defendants <laughs> in over nine federal districts who participated in various fraud schemes involving healthcare services and exploited the COVID-19 pandemic. When we are at our worst, it is those individuals who seem to be coming out of the woodwork. And as a result, according to the, De the Department of Justice, we might be able to at least identify over $490 million of COVID-19 related false billings to federal programs and theft from federally funded programs. The pandemic era had no shortage of fraud. And if we think about all that offends us, all that we might lose, not the least of which might be our own physical health, our own wherewithal, not to mention our own positive outlook, consider the outlook of an individual who has lost it all. And during the same period of time, the same recent history that we are still smarting from for reasons we can only begin to appreciate, we have the Center for Disease Control and their annual assessment. But this assessment is unlike any assessment because the death toll from suicide is at the highest number ever recorded in the United States. As we record this message today, people are killing themselves in greater rates. And who are those people? We can look, really, to the seniors. We can look to millennials, whether it be overdosing, highest rates of overdose deaths by way of fentanyl and opioids. But we have handguns. I need not bring your attention to the grim reality of what one might do when they take that last step into oblivion faced hmm, with the opposite of freedom, the opposite of solvency, the opposite of the ability to actually... Uh, improve one's quality of life. And maybe it could be attributable over the well, past couple of decades anyway to the conditioning, not the least of which would be the safe social distances that we have been trained to maintain while <laughs> communicating on Zoom, transacting routine business, routine legal transactions by way of Zoom and the internet. <laughs> Uh, how do we dress for the occasion exactly? Do we wear a full suit anymore? <laughs> Fraud on the internet. Where do we put our faith? As we are conditioned to do everything online, and if we think about it, how many items of identification were you required to show in order <laughs> to have access to this message today? One, two, three, four forms of identification. Mother's maiden name. <laughs> uh. Why is that? Are we not all being presumed to be fraudulent? As we consider cybersecurity, it has been reported that it, at least it is expected that cybercrime globally will reach $24 trillion dollars by the year 2027. Now we can compare that to 2022, 8.4 trillion. And there's a significant difference between 24 trillion and 8.4 trillion. We must see fraud differently. More than merely pulling the fire alarm as <laughs> happens on occasion, usually right around finals week. We can go back to Congress for a second. How about Marjorie Taylor Greene? <laughs> uh, she was the victim of swatting recently. She's very public about it. And in being public about it, in describing that law enforcement through swatting received the anonymous tip anonymous you have to believe in what it is that the anonymous report is indicating that there truly are body parts in the bathtub as was the case for marjorie taylor green the representative representing the interests of the good people out of district 14 in georgia <laughs> uh.
This is a member of Congress, swatted, who then makes it public that there's really nothing that we can do on the federal level because after all, there are no laws restricting swatting. Yes, as we will see, there are traditional ways that we might approach fraud depending upon the, well, the species of criminal behavior and where it is in the sector, whether it be a security for the SEC, Securities and Exchange Commission, whether it be counterfeiting, something that, well, might very well be tasked by the Secret Service or the FBI or the Department of Justice through the de Department of Homeland Security, perhaps a local law enforcement agency within each individual state, as we have no federal component to our federal legislature in the United States Code that has ever approached swatting. The Maine Secretary of State, the Maine, well, Maine, the state of Maine, she was swatted. Secretary of State Shenna Bellows, after hmm, choosing to disqualify the former president from the state's presidential ballot, she was the victim. She was swatted, and she was very public about it. Elected officials, congressmen, senators, state government officials, It's the FBI, it's the Department of Justice, where we look to these attacks on our justice system. It strains public services, the cost in the trust, the cost in those most vulnerable groups, specifically those individuals who are the recipients of swatting, where we might look to the origination of swatting Swatting flies, swatting lies. We need to understand what swatting is, what swatting does, <laughs> the impact of swatting, because it's a variance of fraud. It's a material misrepresentation of fact that is ultimately calculated to induce reliance. Here, it's the reliance of law enforcement to respond with perhaps guns blazing with the hope that they might be able to preserve public safety. And therefore, it is certainly a problem that must be well, responded to by the Federal Bureau of Investigation. But there's no federal law to enforce. There's no statistics as to how it is that we might be able to interpret this particular attack on our justice system, on public services, on family members, the strain on the prioritization for local law enforcement exposing the most vulnerable, not only millennials who might very well be in, engaged in the gaming subcultures, tour of duty, senior citizens, the not so tech savvy, those individuals who depend upon social media for, well, social interaction, LinkedIn, Facebook, <laughs> X, there are predators online no different from, well, the wolf and Aesop's fable, where the boy is sent to tend to the sheep, that which is most vulnerable. Well, that which is most valuable, the data, the data of our modern time, our own personal identifiers, how it is that we might distinguish ourselves from the predators online, the wolf's the salivating predators who we might assign the same kind of personified fangs dripping, waiting in the shadows to pounce upon those most vulnerable. We must think differently about fraud. We must see fraud differently. It's that data, hmm. home addresses, phone numbers, Anything that can uniquely identify an individual, well, isn't that what law enforcement seeks? The false, misleading reports to law enforcement, notifying <laughs> fraudulently that there's an active shooter. Well, <laughs> if we look to those areas where swatting has occurred, well, we can't ignore the fact that it's not only the fire alarms that are pulled at schools.
It's the report of an active shooter at schools. Where? SWAT units. Ah, now we're getting closer to the derivation of swatting. As you would be swatting flies or swatting lies. No, it's special weapons and tactics. It's the intention to bring about a tactical response by law enforcement through false, misleading reports. Reporting the worst in human behavior, an active shooter, which is not, unfortunately, beyond the realm of possibility, the psychological impact, the straining of resources. And so what? Can we promise a penalty for those individuals who are engaged in swatting? Well, not federally, however, in jurisdictions around the country, states, we have that beginning to change. It's changing in Ohio, where swatting is a felony. As of, well, last year, Governor DeWine signed a bill into law that aims to deter swatting, to prevent swatting, that has been reported to be all too common. Further, it's identified as a violent crime. And if we think about those limited resources that are available and what it is that those resources hope to accomplish when they respond to a call where the worst is reported fraudulently, misleading law enforcement into concluding that there is a threat that doesn't exist, understanding that it we have a financial as well as a cultural strain in the form of the fraud that is born of swatting. It is the great state of Ohio. <laughs> James Trafficant. Yeah, I know. Mike DeWine is not from Youngstown. Where we have House Bill 462 which declares that anyone who reports false or misleading information to a law enforcement agency, emergency service provider, or public safety answering point can be found guilty of, well, the fourth degree felony. The minimum sentence for a felony of this nature is going to be, well, a year in prison. However, if we think about the prohibition of swatting, adding swatting to the definition of an offense of violence, where we can look to these kinds of incidents occurring all across the country as then the, well, the sponsor of the bill, the bill that became the first swatting law in the United States, this bill 462 from Ohio, sponsored by state representative Kevin Miller. He's from Newark. Newark, Ohio, where he says this bill is intended to prohibit the offense of swatting, intentionally making a false 911 call to get police or SWAT officials to respond to a location or incident where there is no emergency at all. If we think about the hundreds of swatting incidents these fake sets of circumstances that require law enforcement to respond. It's not only dangerous for the officers who are responding to the scene, but it's an egregious waste of resources, taxpayers' money. But what about the threat that might very well be perceived? You know, it was... Kevin Miller, the representative from Ohio who found himself being swatted. In fact, all of the state representatives who were responsible for authoring the House Bill 462 have all been swatted. And now that we make it a felony, particularly if anyone suffers serious harm during the commission of a so-called swatting, that tactical response by law enforcement who are trained with deadly force to respond to the worst in human situations, it is the boy who cried wolf who we must examine. After all, it's the boy who cried wolf who alerted 
the community to the threat so that the community would respond and protect that which was valuable, the wealth, the flock. And so on occasion, they would respond only to learn that the boy was laughing, <laughs> having fun for whatever his mental state in regard to promoting the false set of circumstances that would then be misinterpreted and misrepresented deceit, <laughs> destroying that covenant of trust you know, from the book of Daniel, where we think about the truth setting us free. It was the opposite of truth <laughs> where the wolf appears, the threat shows itself. Remember how Aesop's fable concludes the trust has been diminished to such an extent where there is no response time by law enforcement. Continue to report your swatting. If we can't prevent, if we can't deter, how do we interpret the validity, if not the severity, of every 911 call? What's the nature of your emergency? We got a wolf eating the flock. All right, we'll be right there. At what point do you conclude that such an assertion, such a fraudulent state of things is in fact criminally or civilly hmm. injurious? If we look to the components of swatting, we must also understand doxing. Doxing, well, as we will be discussing, it's a product of the deep web where an individual's information will be obtained because there are those individuals. Remember the predators <laughs> salivating like the boy who cried wolf and what it is he was crying about. Well, he had reason to cry. If we think about the severity of these individuals and what it is that they wish upon the rest of us to exploit us, well, not only for our money, but well, for all that we hold dear. And so, the individual must cloak themselves in anonymity when they report. And sometimes it's out of state. Sometimes it's out of the country. Because as we consider swatting by way of SWAT, remember the tactical response that we hope to bring about from law enforcement by providing a misleading statement, a fraudulent statement, the most hyper dramatic. Well, this information can be acquired through doxing, through the deep web searching, through the deep web. Well, and in the deepest depths of the web, we have the dark web. As we consider what it is that might very well be the source of the deep fake. From swatting to deep fakes, we look to doxing, the accumulation of information from deep searches Beyond that, which you know, might be available by way of Google, it has been explained that really Google or any other kind of search engine that we might deploy <laughs> legitimately is going to expose us to perhaps 5% of the data that is available on the Internet, the Internet of Things. The Internet where we've been conditioned <laughs> to conduct ourselves to verify who we are, perhaps through more than one source of identification. Through the doxing, through the diving deep into the dark recesses of the internet, we might very well find the dark web where deep fakes are produced. Something to suspend our disbelief, like those police who are called where there's a report of a crime, oftentimes with hostages. As we consider not the congressman from New York who was disciplined for pulling the fire detector, we can look to other examples of swatting that have impacted the consciousness, not only of our nation, but have impacted our justice system. If we think about doxing, the way that we might acquire, or that those predators might acquire, essential information to perfect their crime remotely, 
anonymously under the cloak of anonymity provided by the internet. The dark web, the deep fake, well, that's a way to produce the address. The individuals who are on the receiving end of the swatting, the hidden identity from a remote location, that material misrepresentation of fact that is conveyed to the authorities so that they might bring about the very specific result, not unlike the boy who cries wolf. But the impact, the morality tale, the allegorical value of this notion is that if we continue to allow swatting to hmm, continue in its current trajectory, no, oh, those very institutions that we believe in, something other than those sources of government for which we bring about our legislative solutions to society's problems, those individuals who craft the laws that must be enforced by those very agencies that now will interpret the report of a crime and the hostages taken with AK-47s of blaze to be nothing but fantasy. And as we consider the alternate reality of fantasy, uh, alive and well with gaming communities, it is the gaming communities, <laughs> Call of Duty, <laughs> where we can thank online for mm, this notion of swatting. No federal law currently makes swatting a crime. Now, it's illegal to misrepresent whether or not there is a bomb threat. Yeah, we could say that an individual who obstructs justice or who uh, falsely testifies to a police report might very well be liable or criminally responsible. But we're responding to places where there is no crime. And oftentimes, once the law enforcement officers respond, there's something worse than what it is that they responded to. I'd like to bring your attention to 2018, where the first known swatting incident occurred in Wichita, Kansas. And if we think about Wichita, Kansas, we can consider the phony 911 calls that I'm sure the 911 operator receives on the regular, not only in Wichita, Kansas, but as they will report, this is a phenomenon that we're experiencing throughout our nation. But here we have a human face, a name that we can associate with what would otherwise be uh, anonymous. And it's because he was traced. <laughs> He was traced together with a few of his friends, all engaged in Call of Duty. You know, that's an online game, something that people play to, well, win points. Win points by acting in a, in a military way. <laughs> Guns a-blazing. Achieving their objective. Well, here the objective was nothing less than nefarious for Tyler Barris. 1,300 miles away in Los Angeles, 1,300 miles away from Wichita, Kansas, where he was engaged, well, with some other individuals in Call of Duty. And they were playing the video game online. And they had cameras where they can watch the other individual who is in, well, receipt of, I guess, the most recent drama provided by the video game. And what we see here in this particular incident, December 28th, 2017, we have Barris from Los Angeles who contacted the police in Wichita, where he said he had fatally shot his father and was holding the rest of the family hostage. Officers responded to the Wichita address, demanded that everyone inside the house get out. Of course, the individual who was there was confused. And 
didn't understand why it is that the Wichita Police Department, the SWAT team, guns drawn, why it is that they were demanding he and everyone else within the home get out of the house. The individual was confused as he stepped outside where he raised and dropped his hands several times before an officer opened fire, killing him. So it was Barris who has the distinction of being the first known swatter in American history to actually be convicted of swatting. But because there was no crime called swatting, he was charged with a number of other fraud-related crimes, making false reports, hoaxes, cyber-stalking, interstate threats. Interstate threats by way of electronic means. <laughs> We're talking about wire fraud. Remember the material misrepresentation of fact calculated to induce reliance and does to a particular hmm, set of damages, a loss. Well, here that loss is far beyond what it is that we might calculate financially. Here we have a law enforcement officer killing another individual simply because he was confused, continued to raise and lower his hands. What else was the trained officer to do? The question is, is was that the intent of Tyler Barris in Los Angeles? who, through this gaming subculture, concluded that it would be in everyone's best interest that this particular individual states away 1,300 miles where the instrumentality through the firepower of the local law enforcement agency might be deployed in the worst way possible. Expensive, dangerous, deadly. So if we think about Tyler Barris, he's, uh, he's serving 20 years in prison for making the hoax 911 calls, reporting the hostage situation in Wichita that ended up with police fatally shooting an innocent man. Expensive, dangerous, deadly. It's the Ohio Attorney General who received the call. My name is Jamal, and I just shot my wife with an AR-15. Local law enforcement responded. They responded to a murder-suicide in progress. There was the promise that it could turn deadly. It was promised to law enforcement that the source of the violence would shoot on sight. Misrepresentation and deceit. Oh. What is it that we could lose? What is it that is at stake? Again, we go through the, <laughs> the whole human experience. We can go back a thousand years before the common era to Mosaic Law. The ninth of those... <laughs> Uh. Ten Commandments, bearing false witness, an observation that was made uh, long before there was an English language, long before there was a dark web, there was a dark sensibility. And if we think about this dark sensibility through which we might navigate, a silk road <laughs> from which we might well, do our business. It is the name Silk Road that was taken uh, by Ross Ulbricht. Ross Ulbricht is currently serving two life sentences at the federal penitentiary in Tucson. It's Ross William Ulbricht, whose mother, now deceased, opened freeross.org, the website dedicated exclusively to exonerating her son. Her son, who in 2011 used the dark web 
used Tor, the onion router, <laughs> a special network of computers on the internet. It's distributed all over the world. It's designed to conceal true IP addresses of the computers on the network and thereby the identities of the network's users. Concealed anonymity from a remote location to engage in, well, what Ross Ulbricht concluded to be consensual behavior from adults, the trafficking of narcotics, weapons. It wasn't until Ross Ulbricht actually uh, contracted for the enforcement of such a transaction <laughs> because it is Bitcoin that he was using. And even though the currency that we might be accustomed to promises that our currency is good for all debts, public and private, it's the cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, in its infancy that was chosen to be used by Ulbricht in those transactions where he presumed to be between two or more <laughs> consenting adults way back in 2011. In fact, from 2011 to 2023, law enforcement agents were able to uh, identify the Silk Road. And since this was in the aftermath of uh, the 9-11 attacks, the establishment of the Department of Homeland Security and the fact that many of these transactions were occurring in foreign countries. It was terrorism that was feared. So we have fraud, but the only way that we might very well become excited about fraud, the perpetuation of something that has been identified literally since the beginning of time, since humans began to commit thoughts to parchment, to scrolls, singing the threats around campfires, Aesop's fables, personifying the wolf as the salivating predator, the fly, <laughs> necessarily to be swatted. But it's the consensual actions of adults on the internet presumed to validate the transactions for narcotics to enforce those transactions well, by contracting to kill those who owe you money. <laughs> In fact, there was some nefarious behavior on the part of the investigators who helped themselves to the Bitcoin, to the passwords, so that they themselves might abscond with the ill-gotten gains. A precursor to the Silk Road 20 years ago... <laughs> first made known, at least to the consciousness of the United States, as the net's biggest scam, that's in October of 2004. Fishers steal your money, ruin your credit, and wreck your computer. What do you do if you get fished? It's the dark web. And if we consider the dark web, I'd like you to consider a name, Brett Johnson, who no longer is, well, one of the... Uh, nefarious characters to operate the shadow crew. He was arrested <laughs> uh, together with 32 other people in six countries way back in 2004 after uh, the shadow crew made Forbes magazine. It seems that there's a process where we might discover those bad actors on the internet or those bad actors who perpetuate fraud. And we might find them before we find them in a courtroom anyway. We might find them on the cover of Forbes magazine or within the within the pages of what used to be a magazine. And Brett Johnson, who now has the distinction, after serving time in prison, after being one of America's most wanted, hunted by the Secret Service, arrested, charged with fraud-related crimes, cyber crimes, as a member of the Shadow Crew, a precursor to today's dark web, who now teaches law enforcement groups at Quantico, Virginia. It was the Shadow Crew, this amalgamation of individuals, nefarious actors, uh, 
who came together ultimately to be charged with conspiracy, transferring false identification, uh, offering access to devices without authorization, counterfeit bank cards, encoding equipment. Well, this was a precursor to what it was that was being used in the Silk Road by Ross Ulbricht. This was the beginning of the dark web, and through the understanding of those individuals who are paying attention, it's Forbes magazine that actually conducted the initial investigation, uh, transferred to law enforcement where the Secret Service could ultimately build a case, where Brett Johnson now routinely pays or is paid in full by paying back <laughs> what it is that he has produced in his contributions to the dark web and understanding the process of gathering data, committing the crime, and then ultimately uh, ways to make real the cashing out of the value of that data that is gathered, stolen personal identification, credentials for verification, profiles created through social media merely by paying attention to the metadata profiles are being created for individuals so that profiles can be fraudulently created so that those individuals can engage in business or well nefarious behavior without the true actors being determined exploiting ignorance for personal gain fraud ignorance since time immemorial, same as it ever was, the deceit plus the inducement equals the loss. We might consider more than mere fraud, the species of fraud, securities fraud, wire fraud, conspiracy to commit fraud, by any other name, fraud, and then there's fraud. <laughs> we need to look at fraud differently. We can look to a whole series well, of films, <laughs> Hollywood's products, that advertise the true crime, hopefully with a, well, with a twist, maybe something that would gain our interest to help us to better understand without the necessity to have reverse engineering as to how it is that the loss could be realized in the first place. Upon discovery, well, we must begin the reverse engineering of trying to figure out how it is that we could have been duped for all of these items of wealth, or worse. How are we responsible for our own loss, blaming the victim? These are the components to fraud, and we have to see fraud differently, how it's achieved now, not only do we have the likes of Brett Johnson, formerly of the Shadow Crew, virtually inventing the dark web and helping us to understand how it is that these crimes, these deep fakes, how it is that we are forced to rely upon a false sense of security. We can go back to the film from 2002. <laughs> uh, Catch Me If You Can is the... Well, reported to be true story of Frank Abergnale. Frank Abergnale, who uh, was played by Leonardo DiCaprio. <laughs> Catch me if you can, he told the FBI, the agent played by Tom Hanks, who ultimately visits Frank Abergnale after a whole career of fraudulent behavior, only to be visited within the prison cell and offered a job. Hey, Frank, would you like to teach those upcoming FBI agents how it is that they might be able to be more sensitive to fraud? <laughs> Frank said, sure. And that's how he has made a name for himself. Frank Abergnale, just like Brett Johnson, they enjoy freedom. Unlike... Ross William Ulbricht, who continues to serve two life sentences at the federal penitentiary in Tucson. From the boy who cried wolf to the wolf of Wall Street to Wall Street itself, we might look to the composite character of Gordon Gecko. <laughs> 
<laughs> a creation of Oliver Stone in the movie Wall Street, where he asserts that greed is good. Greed is good. St. Thomas Aquinas, the seven deadly sins. Oh, there we go again, offending the sensibilities of an atheist. I'd like you to know that these morality tales have something uh, that is also a reflection to our own culture. Jordan Belfort, speaking of culture, might very well represent the anti-hero in The Wolf of Wall Street from 2013, the film by Martin Scorsese. His story. Jordan Belfort, who himself had an article dedicated to him, <laughs> The Real Wolf of Wall Street in Forbes magazine. His so-called original takedown from 1999. It was Jordan Belfort who calls himself the Wolf of Wall Street, where we might consider those criminological theories like eh, differential association theory. We'll discuss these ways that sociologists and criminologists might interpret this bad behavior. Acting in conformity with the, you know, with the bad behavior that you want to project upon others, becoming the wolf. Becoming the wolf and incentivizing others to, well, ex exemplifying the very characteristics of the predator, salivating, fangs, high-fiving and back-slapping those individuals, incentivizing individuals, teaching them a learning theory. Now we're going to talk a little bit about Edwin Sutherland the individual who in the late 1930s is responsible for crafting the notion of white-collar crime, helping us better to understand that it is white-collar crime that comes from those individuals who have an expertise within their purview, their occupation, where they have an expertise beyond our own, and therefore we must rely upon these individuals. In the case of Jordan Belfort, the Wolf of Wall Street, well, he talked people into investing money. He cost investors as much as $200 million. He was sentenced to four years in prison. He ultimately served 22 months. But all we need do is... Uh, a search on the internet and we can find Jordan Belfort teaching people how to sell. Just as Ross Ulbricht used the Silk Road, the Tor, the Dark Web to sell. Or Bernie Madoff. As we consider white collar crime, as we consider another individual from the era of Edwin Sutherland back in the 1930s, one Carlo Ponzi, the namesake of the Ponzi scheme. We can also look to Bernie Madoff, who died in prison during the COVID era, was not given mercy, was not given release due to COVID. Madoff pleaded guilty to 11 federal crimes, operating the largest Ponzi scheme in history. What's a Ponzi scheme? Well, it's named after, it's fashioned after the namesake, Carlo Ponzi, Charles, the immigrant from Italy, during the 1920s, where he was able to persuade uh, influencers, like members of the Boston Police Department, to invest in his scheme, it involved coupons, coupons that could be cashed in at the post office, a glorified stamp that might be more valuable in uh, one area of the world versus another, call it arbitrage. The arbitrage that we're discussing here is the, uh, the changing of money and the selling of things where the market provides, well, opportunity. And it's the opportunity to mislead people. Bernie Madoff. We remember his name because he burned them and he made off with their money. <laughs> uh, ultimately dying in prison, but not after being responsible for taking over $170 billion. We examine the contributions of Edwin Sutherland, where he reminds us that it's the white-collar criminal that by virtue of the... Uh, 
responsibility that the person has, their job, their occupation, their expertise, where we ask ourselves how it is that people might be able to be persuaded by these wolves of Wall Street, Jordan Belfort, Bernie Madoff, who burned them and made off with their money. Well, they have to be likable, charismatic individuals who believe in what they do. But it was Bernie Madoff who ran the NASDAQ, the tech-related stock exchange. He ran it for 30 years while he simultaneously was putting profits over people and not investing people's money, where he was engaged in a Ponzi scheme, where he would take money from one investor. He would put that money in his pocket in a very simple interpretation of how the Ponzi scheme was accomplished. He would then find a second investor. The second investor would give him money. He would then take part of that and give it to the first investor or at least present it to the first investor as a return on their investment. But the material misrepresentation of fact, remember, we're talking about fraud that was calculated to induce reliance and in fact ultimately amounted to uh, millions of dollars of losses visited upon the investors in the Ponzi scheme. That was the material misrepresentation of fact, the fraudulent notion that there was an investment at all. During the investigation of Bernie Madoff, it was the SEC that concluded that they had no records of any transactions. So where was that money going? Cayman Islands, offshore accounts, art, real estate? The world may never know. The Wizard of Lies, the film based upon Bernie Madoff, who burned them and made off with their money, starring... Robert De Niro. It was Madoff who died in prison in 2021 after being denied mercy. After being convicted. Securities fraud, investment advisor fraud, mail fraud, wire fraud, <laughs> money laundering. Eliminating the ill-gotten character, the nefarious character, the fraudulent fair character, the, the criminal character, the stench from those ill-gotten gangs, gains, layering those particular assets with legitimately sourced funds, well, money laundering, making false statements, perjury, <laughs> bearing false witness, transcending time and space as we hope to appreciate fraud in all of its forms. As we consider the <laughs> entertainment industry and what passes for true crime as a pastime, we can consider the contributions of the author Michael Lewis in his book, Going Infinite. He profiled Sam Bankman Freed. He was able to actually produce a book and make it available to the general public during the same week that Sam Bankman Freed was found guilty of bilking his investors out of $10 billion. He used much of that money to finance political contributions, venture capital investments, he had extravagant spending as he maintained his business and his offices in the Bahamas. He was ultimately convicted of wire fraud, conspiracy, money laundering. It's Michael Lewis that gives us the entry into the process through which Sam Bankman Freed became the white-collar criminal that he is, the human face of fraud, the opposite of freed, the opposite of truth. And we think about the contributions of Michael Lewis, who also was responsible for the big short, helping us to better understand the foreclosure crisis of 2008, those mortgage-backed securities 
that were passed around like a hot potato, ultimately hmm, increasing those individuals, the percentage of people who live unhoused, making the world the opposite of a better place. <laughs> Maybe the truth will set us free. <laughs> uh, it hurts. And as we think about what hurts us most, we think about health care. I'd like to remind you of, well, The Dropout, uh, the 2022 film based on Elizabeth Holmes. She was responsible for Theranos, where she hoped to make it sound a little Greek. <laughs> Not to be confused with the boy who cried wolf, we have Elizabeth Holmes, who finds herself on the cover of Forbes magazine. <laughs> This CEO is out for blood. It, well, it was vampiric, <laughs> like a vampire. All she needed was a drop of your blood, and she could tell you all that ailed you. The only problem is that it never worked. The material misrepresentation of fact shared by her, convicted of fraud, identified as an element of wire fraud, Title 18 of the United States Code, Section 1343, together with Attempt and Conspiracy, Section 1349, we have Elizabeth Holmes together with her CFO, Sonny Balwani, and they knew that the technology didn't work, but it didn't prevent them from presenting themselves with the material mis misrepresentation of fact that it, did, that it did. And as we think about those individuals with everything to lose, perhaps nothing to gain, we have those individuals who were the recipients of the testing of this technology that was doomed to failure, that never had worked. These cancer patients in Texas, where Elizabeth Holmes promised them, as she promised her investors, that, well, they had something that could revolutionize health care. James Mattis, also known as Mad Dog Mattis, <laughs> although he has identified himself as an emotional support animal. The personification of the wolf is nowhere near this individual, this lifelong Marine who believed so much in what it is that Elizabeth Holmes told him. The veracity, or lack thereof, he was a believer. He was induced into reliance, and he did to, well... The extent of $78,000 out of his own pocket. Well, there are ways that we might be able to respond to fraud in all of its forms, whether it be in the form of swatting, deep fakes, cryptocurrency, and how it is that we might be able to use something as an alternative to what it is that we have historically relied upon as an item of wealth. And if we can conclude that individuals are operating together, we can dust off the old RICO Act, Title 18 of the United States Code, Section 1961, so long as we can find a pattern of racketeering activity that involves fraud. We understand that loss is known upon the discovery and it's through the investigation and reverse engineering that we might demonstrate how the fraud has come to be, how that loss has come to be. But depending upon the evidence, there will be theories as to how best to pursue recovery. If we can persuade those individuals who are, well, <laughs> charged with the responsibility of crafting those legislative solutions to societal's problems, and if we think about what problems impact us most, the problems specific to deceit, the problems specific to the violation of the government uh, of the of the covenant by way of uh, the ancient scripture where we might consider our current law so that we might be able to be something other than slaves uh, to the algorithm a data driven demise perpetrated by dark web predators who are anonymous and remote the wolves, not just in Wall Street, but the wolves that we must, well, be concerned about. 
we look to the Latin, an otherwise dead language, <laughs> <clears throat> that reminds us caveat emptor, buyer beware, caveat vendator, <laughs> seller beware. How about cream and falsy, that species of criminal behavior that is all specific to deceitful means, intended to corrupt the covenants, <laughs> not dissimilar from scripture. We have other trappings from throughout the human condition that indicates that we have a problem that is not too quick to go away. And if we examine the composite character of Gordon Gecko from the fictitious film Wall Street, where he asserts that greed is good, if we typically <laughs> rest our notions upon such goodness, it will be our undoing. For we will not be embracing truth but the opposite. And if the truth will set us free, where will the opposite bring us? A place other than freedom, bondage, incarceration, isolation, squalor, <laughs> separated from that which we value most. Trust in the system, trust in the law. For the Center for Continuing Education, I'm Greg Woods.